Uh, our first guest, Pamela Douglas, is with us tonight. She's an Emmy-nominated screenwriter whose credits include a di- diverse slate of network movies and television series like A Year in the Life, Frank's Place, Star Trek, The Next Generation, Trapper John, and many others. Throughout her remarkable career, she's received a slew of prestigious honors, including awards from groups like the Writers Guild of America, the American Women in Radio and Television, and she's even been the recipient of the highly coveted Humanitas Prize. In the just-released second edition of her book, Writing the TV Drama, Miss Douglas brilliantly encapsulates what she's learned from her many years of experience in the television field. The book is a must-read for all aspiring writers who will benefit tremendously from Miss Douglas's clear, informative, and highly entertaining style of writing. The book has received heaps of praise from insiders who understand the business of television writing better than anyone, including Daniel Petrie, Jr., the president of the Writers Guild of America, who raves, This book is far and away the best resource I know of for any writer wishing to work in this tremendously challenging and rewarding field. It is a great pleasure to welcome to our show Miss Pamela Douglas. Miss Douglas, are you with us? Yes, I am, and thank you for those kind words. Oh, thank you for being with us. I, I, I really enjoyed your book, and I can't wait to uh, discuss it with you. Uh, but first of all, give us a sense of how you got started in the business. I, I, I read that you never really thought of television writing as a career at first. Many people who become writers are always writers. That is, you write because you must speak from your experience that you have the need to communicate and to shape that communication in a way that is accessible to a large number of people. So that means uh, sometimes people who find themselves ultimately writing TV or movies uh, may start writing short stories, may write plays. Uh, There are other avenues, or journalism even. Uh, There are many avenues of expression. For me, uh, because I grew up in New York City, which, which although there is a fine industry there, isn't Los Angeles, it isn't the heart of where uh, entertainment television is made. It actually originally hadn't occurred to me that this was a possibility. But as a storyteller, you find the way uh, to make your tales and your characters come to life in uh, whatever mediums are available. For me, television turned out to be a, a vibrant source of uh, of possibilities because where do you find better character-driven tales that last a hundred hours, uh, which is true of a series that goes for five years, for example. Absolutely. So you get tremendous character depth and storytelling possibilities that have really only grown over the years. So I'm very excited about uh, the future potentials of all of this as well as what brought me along. Well, you said, uh, writer strike notwithstanding, and uh, we hope to discuss that a little bit with you uh, in a little while, but you claim that it, it's a great time to write for television. Uh, why, do you think, why do you think that is? Why do you think that this is as great a time as it's ever been to write this for television? We are in the vortex of change, and uh, we've had an explosion uh, of a good kind uh, of outlets in television, not only have we gone within a decade from uh, a three-network limit to uh, cable production, basic cable production, premium cable production, and then from that uh, even to the whole DVD uh, way of watching television. And now, of course, it's going to be Internet. I have a student in my uh, class at uh, USC uh, School of Cinematic Arts, where I am a professor, who mentioned to me that he does he's a television writing student. He mentioned to me he doesn't own a television. And so I said, how are you going to do this class? How are you going to do this career? And he said, oh, no problem. Um, I download all the shows I want to see on iTunes and watch them on my computer. <laughs> I, that's, that's just it? And I realized, well, of course. Sure. Now we've got DVR, which is started with TiVo and all the other forms of uh, viewer-controlled watching, So, which is one of the things that's sending the industry up the wall because they don't know exactly how to count viewership or, in fact, uh, how to 
you know, make people look at the ads mm-hmm. when you can, when you have so much fewer choice. But all of this, from a creative point of view, only extends the the opportunities. Uh, and so, I think anybody who's getting into the business at this time uh, has the advantage of a a wild west open marketplace, and that kind of scenario usually leads to the possibility of newness in a way that something that is very stable uh, does not. So I think there's opportunity everywhere, but also uh, creatively there's exciting innovation going on Mm -hmm. in terms of the kinds of uh, ways uh, stories are told and the kinds of characters you can see. It's far beyond uh, the early shocks of Gosh, can you use these words on television that used to be censored? It's it's way beyond that to the form of stories themselves and the kinds of relationships you see. Yeah, and I, I want to explore this notion for a little bit, as you do so well in your book. For so long, it was a firmly held belief that uh, television was an inferior medium to feature films. Uh, but now you see more and more uh, movie stars and filmmakers coming to television. What do you think is attracting them to TV that they can't find in features anymore? Uh, Two things. The first and simplest is quality. I know that seems strange to people who understand that there's also some very bad stuff on TV, but there's also some very bad movies. Mm -hmm. So you can find bad anywhere. And we're not talking about uh, writing for Dancing with the Stars or the, or the latest you know, episode of Can You Eat Caterpillars. Um, <laughs> I saw that one. That was very good. Yeah, it was wonderful, yeah. Um, we're, we're really talking about some of the uh, writing levels that we've seen in, in The Sopranos, mm. uh, in Deadwood, um, also on some network shows. It's not, it's not only on, on those. Um, Big Love is Marvelous Weeds, uh, though I don't do half hour. It's really a half hour drama, and, and I think it's you know marvelously written. There's a long list. Um, Brotherhood, Dexter. Uh, I'm sure I'm leaving out some other. House is well written. Well, I know that you speak with in your book. You speak with John Wells, and uh, what first really turned me on to television, I saw a, a big change occurring in TV. Uh, was the West Wing, and I I, I still haven't seen a, a better a better written film than what they've accomplished and what they accomplished. West Wing, Wing was Wing. wonderful, and John Wells is a magnificent manager. Uh, you know, ER uh, John is is currently or has just recently directed the 300th episode mm. of ER. Imagine something going for 300 hours. Yeah. Now they've kept that alive by, you know, revitalizing the cast quite often. Uh, but you know that you know that show is still well written. Mm-hmm. It's it's not new anymore, and so anything that's not new doesn't attract quite the attention. But uh, John Wells is great. Um, West Wing is was a fine example of writing. You know, another great great show which is available on DVD is Battlestar Galactica. That's one of the best. It is absolutely one of the best shows on television. People were slow to take it up because they thought it was the 70s show, and it really isn't. All it got from the 70s was the title, uh, and it became really allegorical politics that was going on in that show. Some, yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, deep, deep uh, dramatic material and, and material that really is hardly ever dared in mainstream features, is uh, in, indie features sometimes, yes, but... I couldn't uh, agree more. Yeah, and so I'm just proud of uh, of some of the great quality that's out there. In terms of what attracts people, it's the opportunity to write well, but also from a writer's point of view, and I'm really speaking specifically of writers here, uh, in television, writers are in charge, mm-hmm. uh, that what you write is pretty well what gets on. In movies, you really have a mass production situation where uh, whatever you write is rewritten by whoever and then possibly also rewritten by the director. It's all subject to the fundraising sources, which doesn't doesn't happen in television at all. And uh, you have this blasted auteur idea 
that uh, it's all the director. I mean, I'd like to see them direct, uh, you know, a blank sheet of paper. So this is uh, part of why television is such a an opportunity for writers because you get to say and see what you have to say. Uh, it's not going to be destroyed by somebody somebody else's ego. It's their medium. I mean, it's, it is it yeah. is a writer's medium, and this extends also to the ancillary markets that touch on television. This uh, extends to webisodes. Uh, it extends to some, certainly direct to DVD uh, to a degree, and we'll see what goes on on the internet. I mean, we've got a a, a hybrid there where anybody who wants to do a mobisode, which is very short, really has to produce it as well. So you you get the writer, director, cameraman, sound man, right. composite person, but that's because these things are one minute long or less. In crafting a television script another mm-hmm. another difference that you 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 set up that tv has against film is that television is a much more intimate media yes. just by its nature and i thought it was interesting you brought up uh what screenwriters are taught not to verbalize something if they could show it because mm-hmm. it's a visual medium right. tv isn't so much like that well uh originally uh the uh the picture size was really quite small, and in order to carry the sense of what you're doing, uh, you were really having to deal with what people said. Also, television came from radio, uh, whereas feature films came from vaudeville. So it was a different different experience. There, it, television is not small movies. Television is a different animal, and uh, that comes from uh, an impulse to give the news and, in some ways, the truth through journalism, then radio, then TV. Uh, on television, you have a phenomenon of a screen in your home and a screen where the heads of the characters are not so different from the size of your head, sitting just uh, feet or, in the case of watching on a computer, inches from you. And so it has an impact that's very, very different mm. Uh, and a power that's very different from sitting in a darkened theater uh, with a mass experience where you know this is a fantasy. You know you're going to something that's not real. TV is is people you know, and that way it gets a power that you have to watch out for because it can be any power can be used for ill or good, and. Uh, you have to watch out for television that is also uh, very strong propaganda right. in right. terms of what is real and what is what is the truth. Yeah. But uh, from an entertainment point of view, it lets you tell deeply personal stories. Well, there are people who never let on that they sit at home crying while they're watching TV things, which they wouldn't let anybody see them do in, in the movies generally. And they're not crying at gigantically emotional stuff. You know, they're crying because they're touched like you're touched by, you know, a truth and a, and a companion. Yeah. It's that kind of thing. The well, same you, thing is true of the comedy side, too. You mentioned, you mentioned in your book NYPD Blue, mm. uh, which essentially, th- throughout its, out its entire run, it essentially adds up to a 250-hour movie. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you mm-hmm. to spend that amount of time mm-hmm. with, with a show, there, there is an intimate kind of bond that takes place. There is. You know the people not as a story that closes in two hours, yeah. but as people who have deep backstories of people you've known just like friends. You know, speaking of NYPD Blue, uh, we really have to give honor to um, Stephen Bochco and Hill Street Blues, mm-hmm. which was the progenitor of all the serials that are now on. You know, there was a time when television closed in an hour. In other words, you would have a story and uh, the hero wins one hour in. You still see that on many kinds of shows. You see it on procedurals like CSI, all the CSI franchises. Right. Uh, they close the story in one hour, and they solve the case. That's not real to life, and what happened with Hill Street Blues is they found out, and I'm just going way back into the 80s, um, which I guess in some histories isn't way back, but for <laughs> television, it's, it's, it's archaeological, um, they found that to really do justice 
to the development of the characters and the depth of these stories, they could not end them in an hour because they wouldn't in life. That this would spin out for many, many hours before we see all the sides and get to all the reveals of what happened. Sure. Uh, and so they just went over, went ahead and let it lap over the edge of that hour, which led to the whole idea of story arcs that go many episodes and um, and have parallel arcs that go through many episodes as well. And that is the style we see in so much television today. Yeah, and those are classified as, as serials, correct? Yes. And there's two other types of shows uh, that you mention, and one of them's pretty much extinct now for the most part, and that's the anthology series. Yes and no. Um, it's true. Like Twilight Zone was an anthology yeah. series, for example, uh, and there are some others. Red Shoe Diaries, actually, uh, which was on for a while, was right. an anthology series. Uh, they come and go. The problem with sustaining an anthology series is that you you are missing the core of why people watch, which is that they know these people and they want to see their stories evolve over a very long time. Mm-hmm. Um, you have a continuing host in an anthology, but you're really getting short story writing. So you can see an episode and then skip three or four episodes and catch one again. And you don't build that audience loyalty that you do with uh, with either serials or with the uh, other common type, which is just shows that have closure, such as I mentioned CSI yeah. or, um, or any of the other uh, crime-solving, puzzle-solving shows. It interested me because you spoke to Ann Donahue yes. in your book, and she is the co-creator and the showrunner of CSI Miami. Yes. And she said something. Uh, she said that no one cares about plot, but they do care about story. Can you talk about the difference between those for us? It's a, it's a somewhat subtle difference, and what she means is that people don't emotionally care about the machinations that, uh, oh, here's a, a clue uh, to this thing, and, you know, I'm going to... Uh, you know, I'm I'm going to do this conflict or this battle now. What they care about, however, are the things that make the plot run, which is character based. In right. other words, uh, what the, a character wants and what they do to get what they want, as opposed to imposing on it a grid, a structural, a, a grid of uh, of a series of conflicts. It's a slightly subtle difference, and what she was talking about in that interview was she was um, talking about the struggle of people who write for shows like CSI, which are clearly Mm plot-driven, because you go clue to clue to clue uh, with each scene, and the struggle that the writers have to uh, cope with on every single episode, which is to restrain themselves from limiting themselves to only puzzle solving and clue solving yeah. and deal with what's under that in terms of who are these people. Yeah, and whereas an older series uh, might have just been uh, focused on just solving the crime, and you talk about that too, how what what executives are looking for, they're looking for characters you want to live with, first of all, yeah. and a concept that is familiar and yet has a different spin, like like what Deadwood did for the Western or ER does for the medical drama. Right. Um, I almost wouldn't even if, if uh, well. Let, let me let me back up to say um, I teach a, a class, a an MFA class at uh, at USC that is uh, doing a television thesis in creating an original series. Each person in the class is creating an original series, yeah. which means a pilot, another episode of Bible for the show, um, and I. I really am encouraging each of them uh, not to, on the one hand, understand that there are franchises that are helpful and useful. On the other hand, not to pander down because you will never succeed by writing down. Uh, you you must go for your originality, most especially now in this open marketplace. Deadwood is a west was and it's no longer on was a western only in the broadest definition of it it was set in the american wild west mm-hmm. and it had many of the prototypes of that it had the, the horses and the you know the old west town and the bad guys and the gun shooting and all that stuff 
but what made that st- that series uh, brilliant was the relationships and the depths of characters and the uh, struggle and the search of the series itself, which was truncated because it was off the air before its quest was finished. But uh, that, as opposed to the guy in the white hat, you know, coming into town and solving every everything by shooting the bad guy, mm-hmm. which was the old timey way. Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to go through the process as you do in your book of pitching your idea to a network. Mm-hmm. Uh, you break it down quite well. Uh, if you could summarize as best you can what this process includes, you say that a network may start by hearing up to five hundred pitches. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all. Somebody who is out there with an idea for a show uh, shouldn't play this game alone. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's like don't 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 try this at home. Um, networks and uh, other development outlets aren't going to hear a pitch for from somebody who just has an idea or who's a beginning writer. Uh, if you want to get into this, first of all, you really need to be able to write well. Mm-hmm. and to have some sample scripts, usually for existing series first. But let's say you've got that, and uh, you're going to, you're here in Los Angeles where you have to be to play the game at all. Um, the first thing you would do is uh, approach a showrunner who already has the has proven ability to deliver every week because on television... You can't have, whoops, we couldn't get it done in time this week. Uh, sorry, there's no show. We'll see four or five reruns or, you know, we'll run an old movie. Yeah. Um, and so you need to get a production company that can manufacture the show. Uh, and so your first step is not to pitch to a network. It's to pitch to some uh, production entity or showrunner, executive producer, who you respect and who has done shows of the sort that you have in mind. Um, Once you get them on board and uh, you really have a package around your idea, it may be uh, the notion for the pilot, it may be uh, the whole series concept, it may be attaching an actor or other elements that are attractive, sometimes it's sponsorship. Uh, There are many things you can do to bolster your chances. At that point, you may get in uh, to start presenting to uh, networks, and when I say networks, I also include uh, cable, which does uh, all the different cable outlets that do uh, original dramatic series. Yeah. Those guys, and, and, and women, mostly guys, but, but the people at, the let's say, networks, uh, when they open for business, when they open for pilot pitches, uh, they are going to be listening from roughly June through October uh, every 20 minutes or so a day, every day of the week, plus lunch and dinner and and breakfast meetings. Uh, And they've already gotten something filled before they even hear these pitches. So it's a real... A steep competitive slope uh, to get them to give you the go ahead, but you will when you get in there. You know you are one of hundreds at each network uh, who is proposing a series. If they are uh, in trance and they think this is good business, and also that it's creatively interesting, and these days they're also looking for an additional element. Everybody is looking for an Internet component as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we should at some point talk about the quarter-life phenomenon, which is, uh, we'll have to come back to a show that actually began on the Internet instead of on regular television and is now going to NBC. Um, so they also sometimes want a YouTube presence or a campaign that involves an Internet as part of the pitch itself. Once you get in there and... If you tell them the story and they love this, your show is still not on the air. The first thing that happens is that you're given an assignment to write the pilot episode. So 
it's a writing job first before it's anything on the air, before it's even made. Mm-hmm. So everybody, uh, if, you, if you're following a traditional development schedule, which has really been broadened, and a lot of places tell you they're open all year round, even though they're kind of not, but um, if you're following a traditional plan, uh, you would get a go-ahead to write the pilot, which uh, would be f- finished and delivered to the showrunner, the production company, um, by around Halloween so they can do all the fixing and polishing and drafting they need so that you can get this uh, into the uh, networks around Thanksgiving time. So these, those scripts are going in now. Mm-hmm. People traditionally hope that they will get an answer about, uh, yes, I will give you a go-ahead to produce this pilot um, by the beginning of January. Sometimes it's a quick turnaround, sometimes it's a little slower. But generally what happens is if there is a yes on, yeah, green light to actually make this show, then uh, all of a sudden, all over town, everybody's getting the same green light. And so now we're in pilot season, which is about producing these things. And there's, a, as I say in the book, a giant vacuum sound all over town because all the crew people who aren't working on existing shows are now working on pilots. Um, actors are needed to make long-term commitments, which are, are scary and chancy right. because then you can't do another show. Uh once it gets finished, all the post people, that means the editors and so forth, are all swooped up in this. And all of these pilots are delivered uh, at the same time around April uh, to all of the networks and other outlets all over town, all over everywhere. So they've got everything. It all goes to New York because these still are corporate decisions because many, many, many millions of dollars are have to back the production of a show so it becomes a business decision at this point where all of the pilots are screened in the beginning of May um, within just a couple of weeks at all of the networks then the announcements come out uh, whether your show uh, has a full season pickup uh, a uh, partial season pickup uh, a mid-season pickup a uh, short order for just a few episodes, an order for backup pilots, backup scripts, because they like the idea, didn't like the way it's produced, or isn't a go at all. Mm. Uh, and so those, those, very ten- those are very tense times because would, companies assume, yeah. uh, rise and fall on whether they get an order for something that they've invested in tremendously, really tremendously. These are expensive. If you get a go... Um, you have to somehow get multiple episodes of this show in the can, uh, or there are no more cans, but you know what I mean, <laughs> so that, uh, so that you, if you've got a fall pickup, uh, you're going nuts all summer so that you can be on the air in uh, September or uh, early October, unless you're lucky enough to be able to have the luxury of being at mid-season. Yeah, right. that's quite a roller coaster ride. I don't it's think I'd have any. I don't ride, think yeah. I'd have any nails left after <laughs> after that process. Oh, it's it's very tense. It's it's exhilarating to people who like it. It's a thrill to win. It's also a lot of work yeah. done under very heavy deadlines, which is why I say don't try this at home. It's really for the pros because you have to be able to write quickly and to do all of the other phases right at the top of your craft because uh, it's not training time you really need to learn first if you're going to get into it though not as a show creator but just to learn uh once a show is picked up if you can get on staff or any job in it you start to learn the ropes and then later you know you get to do your own yeah yeah and you mentioned the the blossoming influence of of the internet and uh all all the different types of te- technologies now that are coming out that give give writers and, and expand the, the horizon of TV, what TV is capable of. Mm-hmm. But uh, that's a big point of contention that has led to this writer strike uh, that we're going through now, if I understand it correctly. And mm-hmm. I, I want to get your take on how you see the strike developing, if you see it 
uh, that both sides want to make compromise, and hopefully this will come to an end soon or not. I wish it would come to an end. Everybody does. I hear they're going back to the table on November 26th, so that's, uh, you know, 10 days, actually less than 10 days away. Um, and everybody is hoping that they will be able to compromise. We have, we writers, have uh, faced a solid wall of uh, unwillingness to uh, admit even the basic reality in my mind, which is that uh, they are making a zillion percent, (laughs) they're making lots of money, on everything and all of these uh, non-traditional fields, whether that's DVDs or whether that's Internet exploitation and anything else that may come along in new media. They are doing very, very well. Their profits are huge. Bigger than they used to be, because back when this was first negotiated in 1988, uh, they argued, well, we couldn't give you writers or, or actors, for that matter, or anybody else much in pay, because the manufacture of the video cassettes is expensive. Well, that's disappeared because it's all digital now, and there is no manufacturer. There's nothing. <laughs> There's just taking what the writers did and the actors did and the directors did and um, and putting it online, and they're making huge profits. They're really rolling in dough. Yeah. And turning around and saying to the writers, uh, oh, gosh, we don't know if we'll make any money. Duh. Do you think there's going to be written entertainment on uh, Internet? Let's wait and see for the next 10 or 20 years, yeah. and then we'll think if we want to pay. I mean, they do pay a little something. They pay, uh, I think, one-third of 1% or something like that. Um, but it, it's it's incredible because they are doing very well. If they were doing badly, um, you know, there's another model. I mean, I... Certainly, like the auto companies, for example, when they were having you know such a bad time, turned to their unions and their workers and said, "Listen, our profits are way down. We're really struggling. Uh, can you work with us? We'll make a deal together. We'll you know let's figure this out." And then there's some some working that way. This is not what's happening in this case. In this case, we've got uh, mega mega companies. This is not writers versus producers. That's a misnomer. Um, the producers in television certainly are writers. This is writers and actors and all the people who work in the medium uh, versus the huge media ownership companies like uh, News Corp and uh, and you know beyond NBC's GE. These big big companies to whom the entertainment industry is a blip on the bottom line. Uh, that is. Now, I think what is going to be advantageous in terms of resolving this is that the ripple effect, certainly here in Los Angeles, is devastating. Yeah. Um, there are, I was talking to somebody who knows somebody who's in the pizza delivery business who said he's, lost his, he's losing his business because his whole thing was delivering pizzas to writers while they were in the, in the writer's room. Yeah. And dry cleaners. Uh, who are going under because shows are closed, so they have no cleaning business on the costumes. You know, if the ripple effect is is almost unmeasurable through Los Angeles, and I think there is on some level that's way over our heads as writers or even writer producers, um, somebody talking to the mega corporations to say, listen, there's uh, there are issues in the economy at large. Mm-hmm. And this is having a devastating impact. Settle it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? and, and people don't realize that, I, I don't think. You're talking about the economic devastation. that, that L.A., I mean, this is the, the bread and butter of L.A. That, yeah. This is why, as a writer, you suggest that you have to live in L.A. because that's where the industry is if you want to be a television writer. In television, it's certainly true. Once you reach a certain level, it kind of wouldn't matter if you wrote on the moon. Uh, because you can just you know you just send the thing in, and if you do movies, uh, it kind of, it doesn't really matter. You have to come for the meetings, but you don't have to live here. If you're on a series, you're you're there in the office every week. There are a small number of series 
that are produced elsewhere. There's uh, very few in Florida. Yeah. Uh, there are a few in New York. But even shows like Battlestar Galactica that that actually produced in Canada, in Vancouver, uh, although they're moving, but did at one time, and there are others that produced in Canada, had their executive offices and their writers worked here. 